Alright, book of Philippians, chapter 3. Continue on with our study. Again, my, my intent, Lord willing, is I'm just going to keep right on going, right on through the New Testament. And then we'll see what God wants to do from there. Maybe the rapture will come by. <laughs> Amen. Alright, Philippians. You know, uh, I've said, you know, 
a multitude of times, you know, if you'll just read the scriptures as they're written, you know, and exercise, you know, what you learned in school, you know, when it came to grammar, it's not hard at all to understand it. But we're going to dig into it here. You know, if we pick it up here, verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, and it's important that he says here, of the dead, okay, uh, again, his reference here isn't to whether or not one is going to take part in the resurrection from the dead. <laughs> you know, you've got the resurrection of the dead, resurrection from the dead. Now, he's not talking about the last resurrection here, okay. uh, which is spoken of as the resurrection of the dead, because we're already going to be resurrected. You know, you have to remember to, you know, as the scripture says, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You you can't take something and make it stand alone and ignore other scripture and what it says. I mean, as far as the resurrection from the dead, well, our spirit, our soul, our <laughs> We're already resurrected. The only thing that we're waiting for there is for the body. And we know that that's coming at the blessed hope. You know? I mean, it, I mean if, if, if one's been born again, that, that's without question. 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. 13 to 18. Well-known scriptures. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. <coughs> For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, we know our, our, our if somebody's body has died, Paul tells us plainly, again, okay, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So it's not their soul and spirit that's coming up, it's their body. We have to take the whole body of Scripture together. Okay? Okay. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, go into the next chapter and pick it up, verse <coughs> 9, 10, 11. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we're not going through the tribulation. Okay. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even also, even as also you do. And then 1 Corinthians 15, again, very familiar scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, whole passage here about the blessed hope. We're going to just read 50 to 57. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Okay, so this body that we're in isn't going it doesn't go on the trip. It don't have a ticket. <laughs> it is not going to be there. All right? We are getting another body because this body corrupts. This body corrupts. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying uh, that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection of the dead that Paul's referring to for the born-again believer has to do with this current mortal life and how it is to be lived. Okay? He's, you know, what he's referring to back in our text has nothing to do with either the rapture or to do with the last judgment. Okay? Not at all. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what he's talking about. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. And we want to look at verse 20 to 24. Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness and then back in Galatians again but this time chapter 5 Galatians 5 24 and 25 and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, Paul states over back in 1 Corinthians 15, but in verse 31, the latter part of the verse, he says, I die daily. And what Paul is talking about back in our text verse there, Philippians 3.11, is about the daily striving to live as the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is. That's what he's referring to here. That's what he's talking about here. Not that, you know, I hope I'm going to get resurrected from the dead, you know, or any, that, that, that doesn't even make sense when you look at all the other scriptures. I mean, just these few that we looked at here. Now, while how the Lord Jesus Christ, as a man, walked on this earth before his death, burial, suffering, and resurrection, not only is it admirable, not only is it uniquely amazing how he lived, but that's not the Jesus Christ that we're being conformed to the image of. That's not who we're striving to be like, believe it or not. Who we're striving to be like is the resurrected Jesus Christ. Because that is our ultimate end. To be like him as he is right now. I mean, again, back in our text, verse 10. Okay, the previous verse to that we read. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Okay. There wouldn't have been a resurrection if there wasn't first a death, the death to self. Okay. 
to, be, to do and fulfill the will of God. Jesus Christ, before his death, burial, suffering, resurrection, was not my Savior. But he was then, before he went to that cross, what was he, what was he there offering? What was he preaching? You know, I'm the Messiah. I'm offering you the kingdom to the nation of Israel. I'm the promised king. That was that message. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who got up out of the grave, who came up out of death, out of hell, out of the grave, out of that tomb, who is my Redeemer. And if he'd never gone to the cross of Calvary, he wouldn't be our Savior. If he hadn't gotten up out of the tomb, he wouldn't be our Savior. Because he wouldn't have accomplished what needed to be accomplished to do that for us. Okay? That is my pattern. Who he is, who he is right now, is that that's the body that I belong to. That is the head of my body. That is my bridegroom. That is my captain. That is my king. That is my savior. The Jesus Christ who got up out of the tomb. And I remember uh, going to visit my mother's grave not long after she had passed away. She's buried in a Catholic cemetery. And you go through this, and they, they thought the Stations of the Cross you know, supposed to be the whole thing from, you know, his betrayal. You, know, you go through all this, and you get down, and he's dead, and he's buried, and there's nothing else after that. The next thing you come to is a big crucifix. They left him in the grave. Those are those that have no hope. <laughs> My Savior is alive. Yeah. And that is who I'm being conformed to by God the Father day by day. That is what I'm striving to attain as much as as is possible in this mortal life. And by the way, it's far more possible than most would believe or most care to believe. They don't want to believe that they can actually be Christ-like because then that negates their excuses as to why they are striving to be Christ-like. Okay, You're not going to be given a commandment to fulfill by God if it's not possible to fulfill it. Verse 12. Not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now this is one of those verses where context is so incredibly important. Okay, a text without a context is a pretext. That's the thing that goes. Perfect. This drives the uh, highly educated scholars nuts. <laughs> perfect in this verse is often compared to perfect in verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. Well, hold on. He just said, I'm not, I'm not already perfect. And down here, saying that we are perfect. You know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell you how many commentators skip over that completely <laughs> and avoid it. And it's not hard. It's not hard at all. It's cited as a contradiction of the scriptures by those who hate the truth of the scriptures. Uh, of the perfectly preserved words of God uh, or by those who aren't willing aren't willing to give God the same amount of reasonable doubt 
and something that he says as they expect to get given themselves. Okay, the context of verse 12, perfect is speaking of the condition of Christ likeness to which Paul is striving to pertain, or excuse me, to obtain. He is not yet complete in regards to this. Verse 15, on the other hand, acknowledges the fact that he is, as were and are many, complete in the attitude that's described in verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. You know, so that's the thing. Is that, you know, one of the big problems that, that you're, you're going to run into with those who criticize and tear apart the word of God is they won't take the scriptures as God has given them and they will not take the scriptures and understand the scriptures as God has prescribed to understand the scriptures. They set up their own standards, and if God isn't meeting their standard, there's something wrong with the words of God. Mm -hmm. That's a huge problem. Go to Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For in him, the Lord Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Okay, We are complete in Jesus Christ in regards to a complete salvation, a complete reconciliation, a complete restoration. We are complete in our adoption and our excuse me, membership in the family of God. We are complete in our provision by God of those items which are required in order to be conformed to the image of Christ. All that's wanting is the individual will to appropriate and to utilize those tools that God has provided. That's where we find ourselves incomplete and fall short. There's a lack of will to do what we can and are able to do. You know, I've, I've never yet, in my own studyings, and I'm quite confident I never will, found one supposed contradiction in the scriptures that others claim exists, of course, only in the authorized Bible, that cannot be resolved and has not been resolved by serious, prayerful study of the Word of God. I was telling Kathy this the other night, doing some research. There are 31,101 verses of scripture in the authorized Bible. Do you know that 31,000 of the 31,101 verses have been challenged in one way or another over the years by the good godly scholars out there and who have either produced or promoted you know, the fake Bibles that have been being put out since the 1880s. Now, quite frankly, 29,000 of those are deliberate creations, like what we just had right here, by the commentators invented by themselves, counting on the scriptural ignorance and lack of depth of study uh, of the average Christian and also their, no other way to put it, gullibility in believing that one must have a seminary education in order to understand 
the Word of God. And, well, so throw that out. Of the remaining 2,000 or so verses, 1,600 can easily be figured out with just common sense and reading and believing what God has said, like we just did. Of the remaining 400 verses that are supposedly in question, honestly, only 20 of them could be considered difficult, requiring something other than just common sense and sentence structure. And out of those 20, only five are really hard. You know. So the truth is, rather than 99.966% of uh, the issues of understanding the scriptures that are claimed out of the reality is more in the vicinity of point zero 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 three. Uh, and the five that are truly hard, they can still be figured out. It takes some time in prayer. God tells us to study to show ourselves approved. And he does these things so you've got to study. And, uh, like I said, the problem is men attempting to force God's words to be understood according to their prescribed set of rules and not God's. And we can't go into letting this descend into you know, a study of that particular subject. Lord willing, someday uh, I'd like to take and teach lessons, take those 20 top knots and go through them for you and show you that just some time spent in the Word of God, accepting the Word of God as God has said it and accepting God's rules for understanding His words, okay, they can be figured out. You know. Now, Paul, again, who arguably, you know, greatest Christian to ever live, confesses back here in, in Philippians 3.12 that he knows, I know, that I am not yet perfect. I haven't, I haven't attained, you know, unto uh, the, the, the height of Christ's likeness that's possible while still in this mortal life. But he says, but I follow after. I follow after. I'm not there yet, but I'm not quitting either. That's what he's saying. You know, like the hymn we often sing, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. That's the mentality we need to have every day. If that I may apprehend that, for which I am apprehended from Christ Jesus. Apprehend. Not a tough word. To take or to seize. It literally means to take a hold of. Uh, it can also mean to take with one's understanding. To conceive in the mind and to understand something without uh, prejudice, passing judgment or inference on it. Uh, to think or to be of a certain opinion. It can even mean to fear something or be suspicious of something that is having apprehension. Okay. Paul is constantly striving to apprehend, to seize upon, take hold of that for which he was, which we have been apprehended of by Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus Christ take hold of and seize us? There's the answer. Okay. Remember our context. Being found in Jesus Christ and his righteousness and attaining unto the resurrection of the dead. The power of his resurrection. Yeah. 
The answer can be found in two verses, John 12, 28 and 1 Timothy 1, 15. Go to John 12, 28 first. John 12, 28. Father, glorify thy name. Then there came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And 1 Timothy 1, 15. 1 Timothy 1.15 This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. What did Christ take hold of us for? Number one, the glory of God which is the first and primary purpose of all things. And then secondly, to provide a means of salvation and reconciliation to all people. Paul saying, I want to apprehend that for which I was also apprehended of the Lord Jesus Christ. The glory of God and salvation of lost souls. That's so tough if you actually believe the scriptures. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be 